could turn then to um, Revelation chapter 3 and, and verse 7. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. We're looking tonight at the church in Philadelphia. The church in Philadelphia. Revelation chapter 3 and um, verse 7. We'll read down to verse 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly, hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. Praise God. Let us open again in prayer. I'll just, Ethan, can you just open that back for me? Because I need to see it so that I can see what I'm doing. Thank you. So I can see what's going on. Amen. Well, Father, Lord, we come to you now again afresh this evening and asking, Lord, for your grace, for your mercies, Lord. We've heard teachings on this I'm sure before, and Father, I myself have taught before through this precious um, um, epistle to the, the church in Philadelphia, but Father, I'm asking tonight for something of your presence to come and to make living thy word to us tonight. I'm praying, God, that you would search our hearts. I'm praying, God, that you would come and be glorified in our midst. I'm praying, Father, as that admonition, that, that instruction goes out at the end of each of the epistles, let him that hath an ear hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I pray this evening that you give us an ear to hear, Father. Come, Lord, and speak to us in accents still, Father, deep, my God, spirit to spirit, Father, and bring the depths of thy word to our hearts. I want to ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. To the church in Philadelphia tonight, the church in Philadelphia, we come this evening to um, epistle number six out of the seven. And I don't know how you feel, brothers and sisters, but it's been quite an intense and heart-searching experience. Intense because our Lord has some difficult things to say to his church. Difficult things to say to his church. Heart searching because what he said to his church then, he's not changed his mind on now and would say the same again in our hearing. I want to say that again, intense. Because our Lord has had some difficult things to say to his church Heart searching because what he said to his church then, some 2,000 years ago, he's not changed his mind on. And wherever such characteristics are found amongst his people, we don't need to ask the Lord for his verdict. He's already spoken in these epistles. And as we line our lives and our experience with these, we can receive the commendations to ourselves where commendation is due but where correction is needed and admonition is brought by our Lord, then we can be convinced that he would say the same thing in our hearing were he to walk amongst us this evening. 
As I've calculated, our Lord speaks more to his people by way of correction than he does by commendation. He speaks more by way of correction than he does by way of commendation. And that's quite interesting. In fact, out of the combined words, the positive things our Lord said and the negative things, approximately 40% are words whereby the churches are commended. 40% commendation, which leaves 60% that accounts for our Lord's admonishing. In other words, for every two words that our Lord gives in praise to a church, our Lord speaks three further words, charging them to repent. As a former math teacher, I find these statistics quite interesting and reflective perhaps of the church throughout the age. There's some that would like to go to a place where they're never corrected. It's almost like 90% commendation and 10% wishy-washy and um, correction. But I mean the epistles here to the book in the book of Revelation 40 to 60. 40 to 60. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it has been the story of God's people from God's first bringing up of the children of Israel out of Egypt. What has the prophet said time and time again? Return ye backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. You say that's, that's condemning? No. Return ye backsliding children, and what? We must bring the extra part. I will heal your backslidings. That's the positive. God calls his people to return and he says, if you are willing to repent, then I am willing to forgive you and I am willing to heal your backslidings. There's always hope brought, always hope. This has been the voice of God's prophets from time immemorial. And when you look at those blessings and curses found in Deuteronomy chapter 28, a prophetic forewarning, if you like, of what would happen if Israel ever departed from following the Lord, you will find that for every one of those blessings owing to their obedience, five curses, five curses followed in the wake of their disobedience. Interesting statistics. Have we not yet understood and perhaps comprehended with the heart of a father, as it says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 5 and 6, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. I want you to see that as unto children, my son. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Don't lose heart. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Hebrews 12 and verses 5 and 6. I mean, that is encouraging. My son, don't lose heart at the chastening hand of God. And I tell you in my life, when God convicts me, chastens me and disciplines me, I never lose heart because I know that he loves me and because he loves me, he chastens me. And he does so that the peaceable fruit of righteousness might be found in my life and might be found in your life. That said, as clear evidence is set before us this evening, not only in our Lord's epistle to this church in Philadelphia, but also to the church in Smyrna, it is possible, this side of eternity, to live a life free from the reproach of God. What do I mean? Well, Philadelphia, like its sister Smyrna, was one such church, a shining example to us all, has how to live beyond rebuke. Children of light in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, both Philadelphia and Smyrna, of course they wouldn't have been perfect, but as it comes to what the Lord said by way of commending and what he would say by way of admonition, we find that to both of these churches there was not found admonition, but rather only commendation. The church at Smyrna, we've looked at, and the church here at Philadelphia. And I would to God that we'd have some more, if you like, model examples of such living instead of all this muddy mixture that we see today. 
We should have known by the name that a church in this locale would be worthy of the praise credited them by our Lord. I mean, it's in the name Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. Of course, the name Philadelphia was given to the city, but I find it ironic that brotherly love should be, a city should be called brotherly love, where a church was found in it, to which our Lord had nothing to say by way of reproach. As I said when we studied the letter to the church in Smyrna, I don't find it any coincidence that the only two churches of which our Lord had nothing indicting to say both found themselves in the midst of the purging fires of persecution. We come back to that point again, both Smyrna and Philadelphia. I don't find it coincidence how that these two churches, of both of which our Lord had nothing indicting to say, both found themselves in the purging fires of persecution. 28 miles southeast of Sardis lay the city of Philadelphia. In comparison to the ancient city of Sardis, Philadelphia was the new kid on the block, being only founded in the second century BC. It was a new city. Remember we said that Sardis was some 700 years old plus. I mean it was a very ancient city rich in history, but we see that Philadelphia, second century BC, it was founded. Its natural geography served well to illustrate the robustness of the church residing in this city as one bearing up under trial. How come? Well, due to its location, Philadelphia was subject to frequent earthquakes, most notably in AD 17. It caused a mass devastation when an earthquake swept through that region and it laid the city waste. I mean, it destroyed the city of Philadelphia. There were other cities destroyed besides it. Why do I say that? Well, in true Philadelphia fashion, this city bounced back from this ordeal to become even stronger. A perfect illustration, if you like, of a church in its midst, two bearing up under trial and bouncing back, bearing up under hardship where we would have thought that this church would have been leveled to the ground, and yet we see it bearing up under trial and bringing forth fruit worthy of praise. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7, the trial of your faith being more, much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I want you to see that. Look, the trial of your faith, the putting to test of your faith, your faith to your destruction. Peter says, no, this trial is much more precious than when gold is tried in the furnace and only purified through the intensity of the heat that our faith might not be destroyed, but persecution has this powerful effect of purging and strengthening and purifying our faith as we go through the fire, just like gold tried in the fire. And look, that it might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. I find that fascinating. We'll touch more on that in a minute. Philadelphia lay on the edge of a great plain which was nicknamed the Burnt Land. The Burnt Land. The plain is a flat ground, you know, it's completely flat. Nicknamed the Burnt Land on account of the frequent volcanic activity in the area. Yet what one would deem to be a curse, I mean living in such an area, another would deem to be a blessing. And you say, how? Well, simply because of this activity, this volcanic activity, Philadelphia was one of the most fertile areas in the world, bringing to its great prosperity, not least through its world-famous wines produced from the grapes which grew in this plain. You know, as the ash hit the ground and absorbed into the soil, it made the ground fertile. A curse for some was a blessing to others as great wealth was brought into this area through its fertile plants. 
through its fertile plains, I should say. And again, this serves as an analogy to illustrate the irony of persecution. I want to say that again. This serves as an analogy to illustrate the irony of persecution, that what one would deem surely to result in the obliteration of Christianity. I mean, how many emperors, how many kings, how many rulers down through the ages have schemed that under their watch they will see the eradication of Christianity? I mean, what has it got going for it? We're commanded not to take up arms. I mean, we're sitting ducks. We should have been wiped out within the first two centuries. But what do we see? 2,000 years on despite all of hell railing against the church of Christ persecution rather than destroy the church has only served to strengthen the church and the church exists in its greatest glory where it's being persecuted and not in the absence of persecution I find that amazing but it's true it's true and Christianity continues to flourish exporting its fruit the world over how many, as I said, tyrannical emperors, breathing fire and sulfur against the children of God, have come to learn against their better judgment that the fastest way to spread Christianity is to simply rustle the nest, you know, and you watch as the seed of the martyrs becomes the, or the blood of the martyrs becomes the seed of the church. Have they not considered nor known the words of our Lord that he said some 2,000 years ago, I will build my church, says the Lord, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I mean, if that is not a living testimony, I don't know what is. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now, I want to say it's one thing to have an intellectual grasp of this verse and another thing altogether to be fully persuaded of it it's one thing to have an intellectual understanding of that verse okay but it's another thing altogether to be fully persuaded of it and I want to ask you a question tonight are you convinced I don't mean just that it's in your head and you tick a box I want about in your heart are you convinced of the goodness and the sovereignty of God Almighty. Are you convinced of the goodness and the sovereignty of God Almighty? Because I want to say that nothing will try the genuineness of this conviction than the fires of persecution. It's one thing to say in the land of free, yes, I'm convinced, brother, but it's another thing altogether when the raging heat of persecution begins to burn and in the midst of it we can still be convinced that God is number one, good, and number two, sovereign. He's good and he's sovereign. Look here in verse 7 then in Revelation chapter 3. And to the angel of the church... In Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. He that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts and shuts and no man opens. I mean, this is some revelation to our Lord's faithful bride who itself was bearing up under trial. Who can lay a charge of evil against the Lord? He begins by opening and saying, He that is holy and he that is true. The Lord is both holy, in him is no blemish, he's the quintessence of purity, but also he is true and cannot lie, cannot lie. And I want to ask you, what is your response to God in times of trial? In times when things don't quite go the way we'd hoped them to have gone, in our mind, in our understanding, we would have had it go like this. But in reality, as a child of God, we find that it goes like this. What is our response 
to God because oftentimes through our doubts and through our murmurings, our complaining, we contradict the awesomeness of these two attributes of God. And by our complaining and our doubting, we're saying, Lord, you're not true and you're not holy. I mean, how many times have we said, Lord, why aren't you doing something to deliver me? Here am I, your servant, in the midst of fire. God, how come it is that you're not doing something to deliver me? Why have you turned your face away? And it's in the midst of such questioning that if you and I are not careful, a root of bitterness can spring up within us because it's a fine line to doubting God, to then complaining against God, to become then becoming bitter against God. And we find our closet time vacant. Why? Because we're now offended at God. And we're not willing now to draw near to him because we are now in the secret recess of our heart charging him with some evil. Lord, why have you allowed this to happen? Many, I tell you, have turned back from following the Lord on account of this. But the whole of Scripture, as we behold the New Testament, it declares emphatically this in 1 John 1, 5. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Brother and sister, we are the faulty ones with our reasoning, our thinking, and we'd not be before the presence of God for a nanosecond before he convinces us of his goodness, and we have to humble ourselves and bow our head in shame and say, God, forgive me. You are right, Lord, and I am wrong. You are holy and I am unholy. You are true and I am in error. I mean, we're human beings with our fallible understanding. And I tell you that scripture has to undergird the reality of our Christianity, not our feelings which are given over anyway. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And in James chapter 1 and verse 17, we read every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James chapter 1 and verse 17. I want you to see also not only the goodness of our God, but also the sovereignty of our God. Not only the goodness of our God, that he is altogether light, there's no shadow, there's no darkness within him. Everything that he does is good, 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 even though at times we ourselves cannot comprehend it. I want you to see not only the goodness of God, but I want you to see also the sovereignty of God. He that hath the key, the key sorry, of David, he that openeth, in verse 7, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. In essence, our Lord is declaring to this church his sovereignty. Much of Revelation we see the meaning of can be found in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament. And this phrase, he that has the key of David, is no different. This phrase, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Turn with me please to Isaiah chapter 22. Isaiah chapter 22. I want to just read you a verse here in verse 22. Isaiah 22 in verse 22. Isaiah chapter 22 and verse 22. lifted straight out of here and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder so he shall open and none shall shut and he shall shut and none shall open we haven't the time to go into all the context of this particular passage but you can see clearly that the phrase is lifted right out of Isaiah 22 22 and taken across into um, Revelation 3 and verse 7 
In Isaiah 22 and verse 22, this speaks about the authority that God in taking away from Shebna was going to give to another by the name of Eliakim. Eliakim in verse 20. This speaks of the authority that God in taking away from Shebna was going to give to another by the name of Eliakim. Eliakim in verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. This authority was being taken away from Shebna, we see in verse 15. Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, go get thee unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna, which is over the house, and say. As chief steward over Hezekiah's house, Eliakam was going to be given the keys. In other words, he was going to be given authority to manage over the affairs of the king's house. Shebna was the chief steward over Hezekiah's house, over the king's court. And this authority was being taken away from Shebna and was being given to another by the name of Eliakam. And he was going to have the authority to manage over the king's house, as thus saith the king. I mean, this is some authority. In other words, this phrase, he that hath the keys of David that opens and no man shuts, shuts and no man opens. It's speaking of authority. There was never a greater king on the throne of Israel than King David. Than King David. And during the height of King David's reign, he had unrivaled power and unrivaled rule over his kingdom. David was a type of Christ and pointed to a greater king that was to come. Who's that? King Jesus. And King Jesus has unrivaled sovereignty and unrivaled power over the whole of the heavens and the whole of the earth. I want to ask you again this evening, do you believe that? Do you believe that? That Jesus Christ, when we speak about him being sovereign, what we're saying is this, that he has absolute full control and full authority over every sphere of the universe. Every sphere of the universe. And there's nothing that can happen unless he allows it to happen. Notice we don't charge God with doing everything. Evil we lay at its root. The enemy is the one behind evil, but God nonetheless gives him permission and authority to act and as long as he gives him that authority he has that authority and if he withdraws that authority he would have no authority god is in absolute control why do i say that because in times of persecution we need to be convinced of that here am i being tied to the rack and stretched and a flame set at a bu at a bundle in a um, um, load of faggots at the base of uh, at the base of a stake and i'm being set on fire has God lost control? Is God saying, oh no, what, what could I possibly do to deliver my child? No. He knows full well what is happening and allows it to happen for the glory of his name. Look with me please to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. Matthew 28 and verse 18. Matthew 28 and 18. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. And we've spoken quite a bit about persecution um, over the months and years, really. And you might say, well, what's the point? We're not in persecution. But I'm saying we have to prepare. We have to prepare. We see, as I've said so often, the storm clouds of persecution gathering. We see persecution coming in on the back of political correctness. And already people are losing the jobs. Already people are being brought before magistrates. Already we see hassle in the workplace and on and on the list goes on. We are becoming less and less a tolerant society. Even though we like to use that word, we are becoming intolerant of anyone that would be against what the government has set up as the, as the, uh, as the um, status quo, if you like. But look here in Matthew 28 and verse 18. We read the following. 
And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. There you go. The sovereignty of our Lord Jesus Christ, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And no man knew the truth of this statement more than the Apostle Paul, to whom at his calling Jesus Christ said to Ananias, or, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake in Acts chapter 9 and verse 16. I mean, imagine that before your calling, you were, it was told you that, look, Ananias, I'm going to show him how many great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And you look through the life of the Apostle Paul and you see calamity after calamity, persecution after persecution. That big resume in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I mean it fills half the chapter in stripes often, in shipwreck, and so the list goes on. And how did Paul fare in all of this? Was he biting his nails and pulling his hair out? Was he, um, um, you know, collapsed in some heap in some cave somewhere? Naturally, outwardly, he bore the scars, he said in Galatians, and if you would have lifted up his back shirt and looked at his back, you would have seen the stripe marks that he'd suffered for Christ. But as to him in his inner man, he was a man full of the Spirit of God and full of joy. And pen these words in Romans chapter 8 to encourage us in our suffering in Romans 8 and verse 35. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 35. I want to read these, wor these words. Who shall separate us from the lo love of Christ? This wasn't a man writing this second hand. This was a man writing this from primary experience. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is nobody. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? The answer is no. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Paul wrote, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I mean, Paul wrote these words and was fully persuaded of them and knew them to be such and encourages us in the same vein encourages us. I think of the words attending the call of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1, if we could go over to there please, and verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, I want us to understand this. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4, listen to this. There's a tendency within us to think that look, Persecution must, is going to snuff us out. Persecution, oh no, it's going to destroy us. But the word of God is encouraging us and encouraging us and encouraging us. I want you to see what it says here in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. It was me, the Lord God, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. And look, Jeremiah says, Ha, ah, Lord God, behold, I can't speak, I'm just a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for you will go to all that I will send you, and whatever I command thee, thou shalt speak. 
Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. I mean, that's enough, isn't it? That the Almighty God says, Jeremiah, you, you are nothing, man, I know. But I've ordained you, the living God of heaven, and I'm sending you to the house of Israel. I'm sending you before kings and before those in your own strength you'd never stand before. And I don't want you to look at their faces and fear because I am with you and I am going to deliver you, says the Lord. And in verse 17, therefore gird up the loins, gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command you. Be not dismayed at their faces. Be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confound thee before them. For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar and a brass and wall against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, against the people of the land. And they will fight against you, but look, they shall not prevail against thee. Why? For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver you. I mean, this is what I mean. When Jesus says, I have the key of David, and I open the door and I shut the door, and when I open it, no man will shut it, and when I shut it, no man will open it, Jesus is saying, I am sovereign. And church in Philadelphia, I see your plight, but I am with you. I am with you. Let us look back then at Revelation chapter 3, and we'll go over to verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Again, we see God's sovereignty here, even under trial, is expressed in order to encourage this battered church. I know your works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door. No man should, can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. I want you to see this particular little phrase little strength and I want you to take courage. I've said it before, but I'm convinced from the word of God. But it's not some gladiators that need to stand in the time of persecution. It's not through going to the gym, big muscular man. You know that we're called to be big and strong in ourselves. No. This church here had a little strength. A little strength. And yet they held fast in faithfulness and had not denied the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, if that is encouraging, what hope then is afforded to even us and even the weakest amongst us that we can stand when persecution comes? Right down to the smallest child amongst us who truly has believed in Jesus Christ, that child is able to stand. Here was a church having little strength and yet had not denied the Lord, but had kept his word and had not denied his name and this has been the testimony of the church throughout the ages you look at the annals of history and you see the roll call of honor the names counted worthy to suffer for christ and you will see not many wise not many mighty not many noble not many strong you'll see those weak those beggarly those bent over but those with a little strength and yet through that little strength had kept the word of God because of something called faithfulness. 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 You say, how did they do it? In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You'll be amazed what you can go through with faith the size of a mustard seed, I'm telling you. When the enemy's breathing down your neck, 
and all you have the strength to say is, I can't deny him, you'll be amazed what that profession of faith can do. Who wants to be burnt at the stake? None of us. And no martyr desires to, but what are they to do when being faced with the prospect of denying Christ with the little strength they have and faith the size of a mustard seed, they simply say, I can't deny him. And for that they are burnt, for that they are thrown off cliffs. But what are they supposed to do? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. 1 John 5 and verse 4. And in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They overcame him. The dragon. The dragon. By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And look. They loved not their lives unto the death. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11. There's something that has to click in our hearts, and I'm not saying it's easy, but there has to be this understanding in, 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 in every one of our hearts that, look, death for the Christian is not the end. It's not the first death that we should fear, but the second death from which we have been delivered. Christ died and rose again, and for the Christian, death has lost its power. It can claim nothing anymore over us, and at best, at worst, I should say, can put us into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They loved not their lives unto the death. And we have to come to terms with this, that look, every one of us are on borrowed time. And whether we die today or whether we die in 20 years from now, or whether we live to see 80 and 90, every one of us, if the Lord tarries, will have to look death in its face at some time. We're not immune from death, but we're promised that death will not sting us anymore because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to be absent in this body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And we have to be convinced of this. Because our persecutors, when they lay that gun against us or that sword to our chest, they think, ha, ah, we have the victory. But we say, no, we have the victory. Because by you plunging that sword into me, you think you've destroyed me, but you haven't. This is the victory, our faith, the blood of the Lamb, and that we love not our lives unto the death. And faithfulness perhaps is nowhere greater seen in all its splendor than when set against the backdrop of persecution. But don't stop there, please. It would be remiss of me to mention faith if I did not speak also of grace. Please hear me on this. It would be remiss of me to mention our faith if I did not also speak of His grace. Our faith is one thing, and His grace makes all the difference. And the two always work together like hand in glove. Faith, our faith, and His grace. What did our Lord say in 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 9? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And you cannot describe the wonder and the, uh, and the aura of persecution, the enigma of persecution, without mentioning grace. Because they're normal people like you and I with little strength, faith the, the size of a mustard seed. But yet these little women, these fraily old men were able to be thrown into the Colosseums. And they didn't run around the Colosseum screaming. They patiently bore up under trial as they were ripped limb from limb by the lions. And they went to glory praising the Lord. That isn't normal. That is not normal. You take an earthly man and throw him into the arena, a strong man, he'd be screaming for his life. But we see these Christians died nobly. And we cannot explain it other than the same way we'd explain the death of Stephen. How he patiently and calmly prayed for his persecutors and committed his spirit as our Lord did into the hands of God, into the hands of Jesus Christ. We can't explain it other than the word grace. 
that there's a strength, a supernatural strength that is given to the church in times of weakness. And in times of strength, yes, grace is there. But in times of weakness, grace is there the more. Grace is there the more. Grace is there the more. Look with me then at 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Please, I want us to read this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 7 and 10. This is the testimony of the Apostle Paul. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure, that this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. What might depart? The messenger of Satan, the thorn in the flesh that was sent to buffet him. Trial after trial, affliction after affliction after the affliction, that the Lord allowed a, a demonic being to afflict Paul. Why? Because it's just said that he'd been called up to the third heaven and had revelations that no man had been permitted to be given. And lest he should boast and become proud and arrogant, the Lord decided in his sovereignty to keep him humble. And three times Paul besought the Lord, let this depart from me. And guess what the response from God was? My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. And lest we should think grace is just this unmerited favour of God, Grace is, speaks about the kindness of God. This is what grace is. But what does that kindness look like? It speaks about the provision of heaven being made to you and I. First in salvation, here we see God's provision being abound, uh, abounding towards Paul in that when he was weak, then he was strong. My strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. In verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather boast in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. There was a power that Paul knew in his life. That when he was weak, there was a supernatural power that rested upon him. That gave to his inner man strength to rise up and to rejoice. I mean, how else can you explain that Paul and Silas about the time of midnight fastened in stocks. Their backs bleeding after they'd just been whipped. Singing praises to God. You can't explain this other than grace. God's power being manifest upon mortal man in times of suffering. And I believe that with all my heart because I believe in the testimony of scripture. And I myself in the little times of persecution where I've been called to stand can bear witness with this testimony. There's a grace that comes upon the man. There's a peace that comes into our hearts that we sense God so near to us that in times of the absence of persecution sometimes we don't sense it's true the aim of satan in persecution apart from attempting to rid the earth of god's people which as i've mentioned only backfires the plan of satan in persecution is to try to cause the believer to deny his faith he will rail he will roar he will intimidate why deny christ deny your faith Look, here's the peace treaty, deny Christ and everything will be well. And this is usually always the ultimatum that he puts forth to us. Through the mouths of men, of course, deny Christ and you will go free. But my brothers and my sisters, if we would love life, and I'm speaking of eternal life, then denying the Lord under trial is not an option. 
In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, then what? He also will deny us. We have a choice. Deny Christ and he will deny us. Endure suffering and we will reign with him. First comes the cross, then the crown. Romans 8 tells us the same thing. And look with me at Matthew chapter 10. This is the last passage that we're going to turn to. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. I want us to see this tonight, Matthew 10 and verse 16. And the Lord is preparing his people. We do not have to be intimidated. We need to pray for boldness, yes, because there's a tendency in our flesh to fear. But a man endued with boldness from on high, I tell you, can face the lions because God's grace abounds. In Matthew 10 and verse 16, listen to this as, an, as, as a prospect. This is how Christianity begins. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. I mean, that ought, to shut, that ought to finish the church off before it even gets going. I'm sending you my sheep into the midst of some ravenous wolves. And I don't want you to um, take up arms. Remember Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword. I'm sending you into the midst of wolves and I want you to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men for they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, Take no thought how or what you will speak, for it will be given you in the same hour what you will speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child. The children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved it's powerful powerful they're going to deliver you up just like he said to jeremiah but i don't want you to worry what you're going to answer because i will fill you with my spirit as you stand before them i will give you the words to testify it's supernatural and look in verse 26 fear them not therefore for there is nothing covered that shall be revealed and hid that shall not be known what I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in the light. And what you hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And do not fear them which kill the body and are not able to kill the soul. But I want you to fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And not two sparrows sold for a father, and one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not therefore. How many times has our Lord now said that? Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear. Why? You're more valuable than many sparrows. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, I will confess also him before my father which is in heaven but here it is again whosoever shall deny me before men him will i also deny before my father which is in heaven do not think that i've come to send peace on earth i came not to send peace but a sword it's come to divide i'm come to set a man at variance at odds at division against his father daughter against mother and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that finds his life shall lose it. In other words, if we spare our life on this earth, seeking to escape persecution and in the process deny the Lord, and it says, he that finds his life shall lose it. 
And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it true life, everlasting life. Praise God. Since this church, having little strength, had not denied his name, an open door was now set before them, which no man could shut. Here in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 8. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, because you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. This tells us that there is a season under heaven for everything. Their brethren in Smyrna were bearing up under current persecution and it was set to worse. And remember, our Lord said that Satan is going to cast some of you into prison and you will have trial ten days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life in Revelation chapter 2. Those in Philadelphia, on the other hand, were not going into a storm when Jesus wrote. They were coming out of a storm victorious. They had not denied his name. And now the Lord said, I've set an open door before you and I'm bringing you out and no man will be able to shut it. Praise the Lord. We don't determine the seasons of God's dealings with his people, but it's known to him. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan in verse 9, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Just like in Smyrna, the chief instigators of the early persecution of believers, Jews and Gentiles, were the unbelieving Jewish authorities. The synagogue of Satan, they're called here in verse 9 and also uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 9, they are also called the synagogue of Satan. It's not an anti-Semitic statement. Remember, the early believers were Jews themselves. John himself was Jewish. But what he was saying is, look, these people who persecute you and think by doing this, they are, they are doing my work. They are not. They're doing the work of their father, Satan. Because if they loved me, they would not put my people to death. I mean, it stands to reason. He calls them the synagogue of Satan, just like Jesus did when he said to them, ye are of your father, the devil. He says, behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. I love that statement. Look how the tables one day will be turned. It is not for us, brethren, in this life to exact vengeance. It is not for us to take the sword when we are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But what? We read in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. I mean, we see an amazing turnaround that one day will take place. Jesus here says there's coming a day when those of the synagogue of Satan will come and worship before your feet, they will give reverence and respect to you one day. Obviously, it's pertaining to the future in, in, in glory, when we're in glory. And in some way, they're going to be brought to stand before us. We're going to judge angels, remember? We're not quite sure how all this is going to tie in. And Jesus is going to make them to know that I love you. It's a lovely turnaround of events when soon we're told in Romans 16 and verse 20 that Satan will be bruised under our feet. The God of peace shall bruise Satan under our feet. Praise God. And Jesus says, I'm going to make them know that I have loved you. You remember in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. The Jews said, well, where's your God now? Where's your father now? 
Let him deliver you if he will have you. And they mocked and they scoffed as our Lord hung on a cross, crucified for our sins. We did esteem him stricken, Isaiah says, on behalf of the nation of Israel, smitten of God and afflicted. But look, it was his beloved son. And there was not a moment that the father ceased in his love for his son, but was reconciled in the world through his son. In the eyes of the world, they will always say, where is your God? And they will think they do God a favour by putting his people to death. But all along, Jesus loved us. There wasn't a moment when he didn't. And there will come a day when they will know it also. When they will know it also. That he loves us. In verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. A promise is here is given. Brothers and sisters, we lose sight sometimes. As a new believer, it was always used to tell me that God rewards faithfulness. And I tell you, it was exciting. And I want to say with the authority of God's word, God rewards faithfulness. He does. He rewards faithfulness. Look, Jesus says, because you have, then I also will. Because you have kept the word of my patience, you've been faithful church in Philadelphia, then what? I am going to do something on my part. I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation, which is going to come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Brethren, God is still the God of covenant and he is faithful to bless those who are faithful. God is the God of a covenant, he's a covenant keeping God and he is faithful to bless those who are faithful. Faithfulness to God. I want to encourage you with that to this, this, this evening, the rewards of faithfulness. Let's start to step out in faith, brothers and sisters. You start being faithful in your life before God and watch what he does. Watch what he does. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. A rewarder. And when you mean business with God and press into him by faith, you're going to start to see things happen in your life. It's a given. It's the trust, trustworthiness of God's word. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. What do you say to a faithful church by way of exhortation? I mean, here was a church that was being faithful. What more can you say to them by way of exhortation? Well, Jesus says to them, continue to hold fast. Continue to hold fast. I'm coming quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. And listen to this. That no man take thy crown. Again, as has, has been typical in all of these letters, warnings and consequences are put to the people of God straight. Jesus doesn't mince his words. Now, I want to ask you again, without going into all of this once saved, always saved again, what would be the point of Jesus' words here if it were not possible for them to lose their crown of eternal reward? What would be the point of him saying it? He says, I'm coming quickly. Well done, church in Philadelphia. You've been faithful, but what? My exhortation is to you, don't stop. Keep being faithful. Hold fast, hold fast, which you have that no man take your crown. No man take your crown. And there are some that would say, yes, this is rewards. This is speaking of rewards, okay. But it is my conviction that it's speaking about the crown of life. But that is my personal conviction. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him a new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. 
Brothers and sisters, there is yet an overcoming, he that overcometh. The exhortation to us, the hope that is set before us, the motivator to continue on. Just wait there a second. The motivator to continue on is this. He that overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of my God. My brothers and sisters, we've everything to play for. This earth is but a passing, fleeting shadow. Eternity is forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Hold fast, remain faithful, overcome, and we will receive the eternal reward of our inheritance that has been laid up for us, not on this earth, but in heaven. Look at the glorious future promises that await us as children of God. Write upon him and the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him a new name. The exhortation this, what this evening, brothers and sisters, let us set eternity before our eyes. Jesus Christ is coming back. And he tells each church, I'm coming back. But he tells the church here, in front, hold fast, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast. Jesus is coming back. 2,000 years on, Jesus is coming back. Let us hold fast. Let us set eternity before our eyes. And if God calls us to persecution, which inevitably in some measure we will suffer, because all who live godly in Christ shall suffer persecution, but there are different intensities to it. But should the Lord cause us even to give our lives to lay them down for his name's sake, let us remember this evening what has been shared with us and let us encourage our hearts before him. Amen.